Hello and welcome to class five of developmental psychology for the spring, sorry, the summer 2017 semester at NDSU. I apologize there won't be any video feed of me today because I left the webcam at my house. So you just have to listen to my voice today, which is sad because this is a really fun lecture and facial expressions are probably a, a really important part of it. But it's okay, we'll, we'll survive together. Um, today we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite topics of the semester, and that is prenatal development, childbirth, and the newborn. It's a really fun lecture. Um, if you haven't had a child yet, this will dissuade you from doing so. If you have had a child, I hope that you enjoy um, listening to the lecture um, as a bonus if, you have had a child and want to share your personal experience, I will give you two extra credit points um, on your discussion board. Um, so if you have had a child, uh, feel free to share that with us. Okay. Um, I want to just remind you that our quiz for uh, week one is due at 11.59 p.m. tonight. That is a firm deadline. Um, it would not be wise to start the semester off uh, on a bad foot by not completing the first quiz because that's gonna set the tone for our interactions from this point forward. So make sure that you complete the quiz. You should start it no later than 11.20. Um, I don't recommend putting it off that long, but if you are, don't wait until five minutes before it's due, because as soon as 11.59 rolls around, it's going to submit your work. Um, so, yes. Um, also, remember the discussion board is due at 11.59 p.m. as well. Um, you need to have one post per class. Um, and again, you can miss up to five, up to four, but it would not be wise to start the semester off um, having skipped stuff, um, because when you start coming to me asking for leniency on stuff, I'm going to remember that you kind of didn't take the class seriously right away. So please take the class seriously, and if you are having issues um, completing the assignment, please let me know. All right, so let's get started on today's lecture. Our lifespan begins at conception, and it begins in the sense that everything that happens from this point forward um, affects the way that we develop. So we're not going to get into a discussion in this class about when life, life itself actually begins. It's not something that I particularly wish to talk about, but in terms of development, our developmental lifespan begins at conception because everything after that point can affect how we turn out. So every 28 days in a woman's life prior to menstruation, um, ovum, so eggs, the female gamete, enter the fallopian tube. And so if you think about, I'm going to try something, and I'm not very optimistic about it, but we're going to see if it works. Um, okay, so if you think about, well, I don't know, many people probably haven't really thought about a woman's reproductive structure, but it looks kind of like this. So you've got, oh, this is really awful. <laughs> you've got right here, these little ball things are the ovaries, and these little things right here are the fallopian tubes, and then you've got the uterus, which is right here. That looks like a bug. Okay, so every, um, oh, this is awful. So my classroom that I normally teach in has like a blackboard screen, and I can actually draw at the podium. This is really terrible. Okay, so <laughs> um, the ovum leave the ovaries and they go into the fallopian tube and they just chill out. So let's see, we'll put, pretend like these are actually inside the tube. So we've got all these little ovary, little ovum just chilling, okay? Now every day, oh, and then the uterine lining is prepared to receive a fertilized ovum. So it begins to prepare itself to receive. Um, Every day, men produce three million sperm, and the sperm are the male gametes. Um, so 
wow, overachieving, man. So, <laughs> three million sperm. Now, during sex, and I'm not going to draw how that takes place. Uh, hopefully, we all have a, an idea of what sex um, does. But uh, during sex, sperm travel through the cervix. So, the cervix is the opening at the bottom of the uterus. So, the sperm travel doo -doo -doo, through the um, cervix into the uterus, and then they go up the fallopian tubes. So, it's important to note that there are eggs... Um, chilling in both fallopian tubes. So the sperm go both ways. Um, now, of the 3 million sperm that the men produce, only about 300 to 500 sperm reach the ovum. And sperm actually have a life of six days in the ovum one day. So you've got to be like super, super like quick and, and planful about, about fertilization because while the man can, while the man's gamete can last for almost a week, the ovum that that gamete has to fertilize only lasts one day, and it's probably a good thing because if if they both had the same shelf life, people would have way too many babies, and so um, so yes, uh, the sperm and the ovum interact. For hopefully, if if there is an ovum in there and the sperm reach it in time. Okay, where is this thing? Okay, so how do I make it stop doing that? Aha, okay. Oh, that's really frustrating. So on my, cl and the thing on my class, if you advance the slide, it would take it away. Okay, so this is what it looks like. This, this um, big orange thing is an ovum and these little things are sperm and so they're all attaching themselves to the ovum and hopefully one of them will fertilize it. And then we enter the zygote period and this is a 14 day period when the fertilized ovum becomes a zygote. Um, the zygote is basically the fertilized egg um, and then transforms into what's called a blastocyst, which is a fluid-filled ball of cells. So in other words, within this 14-day period, this, this, these two gametes are combining and through my, uh, mitosis are becoming a single cell. Um, and it's a bunch of different cells kind of floating around inside this blastocyst for a while. And it's traveling down the fallopian tube to the uterus. Oh, you know what? I shouldn't have deleted my picture because, like, so let me draw it again. So you've got your over, uh, ovaries, and then your fallopian tubes, and then your uterus, and cervix we talked about earlier. So the blastocyst is traveling, do, 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 and then it, and on the ninth day of the zygote period, it implants. So it burrows into the uterine wall. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna, ch I'm going to live right here. This is gonna be my spot right here up against the uterus. <coughs> and then it is covered by an amnion, which is an outer protective layer that it contains amniotic fluid. Um, and this protects it from all the bouncing around that can happen. Because, I mean, it's not like a, a woman is completely immobilized during this process. And so that, that fluid-filled sac kind of keeps it safe. And 30% of zygotes don't survive, so it's possible that you can't have a fertilized egg that just, and that it comes down and it implants, but then it just doesn't survive. Um, also during this time, something called the placenta um, develops, and this is an organ that aids in regulating the uterus, and so it keeps the uterus clean, it keeps the temperature regulated, it keeps blood flowing. And uh, also, another structure develops that connects to the placenta, and this is called an umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord is a single vein that connects the embryo and the mom. So, in other words, once this implantation, implantation process occurs, the woman's reproductive structures develop a new organ, which basically is like, like a support system. It's like a net of support. And the net of support provides all of this nutrients and regulation and blood and everything to the zygote, um, which becomes an embryo. And then it connects to the zygote, which then becomes the embryo with an umbilical cord. And 
And so this is what the zygote looks like. So you can see it's a bunch of cells that are kind of forming into this big, this bigger organism that will become a baby. And then from day nine to about week eight, so what kind of within the the zygote period, um, but you know at the end of it, so it's these these are all variable, right? So, um, but at day nine, roughly to week eight, the the we are in what's called the embryo period. And during that first month, we start to see some different structures develop. So the ectoderm is the, one of the first to develop, and that's the nervous system, the skin, and the skin, and it develops the fastest. So in other words, this is our, our, way, of, our way of perception, our way of creating cognitive networks, um, our way of feeling things, and then skin, that sort of the outer layer of the um, nervous system. And then the mesoderm. So ecto is outer, meso is middle, and um, that's our muscles, our skeleton, circulatory system, and internal organs. Those develop next. And then finally the endoderm, so inside. Um, this is our digestive system, lungs, urinary tract, and glands. So all this starts to develop. Now it's not like it's all in place by the end of the first month. It just, these are just the rudimentary forms of all of these things um, are developing. So it wouldn't look like what we would think of when we think of muscles, skeleton, circulatory system. This is just the, these are just the fibrous tissues um, that will become the different, these different structures. By month two, we start to have some discernible external features. And we also see some responsivity to external stimuli. So like, you know, sensitivity to noise, to movement. And this is what the embryo looks like. So it, you know, it's there's sort of a, a, a semblance to a human, but it's still very much not well formed. It's just mostly just tissues at this point that are slowly developing into what will become our various systems and organs and tissues. And I want to just point out this is the amnion right here the fluid-filled sac that the embryo is chilling in. This right here is the umbilical cord. And then this is the placenta right there. OK? And then from week nine to birth, we enter in the last period of, or the last stage of um, prenatal development, and that is the fetus period. At month three, we start to see movement. Um, so the, the little fetus starts to move around and respond to things more. We see um, the organization of systems. So all these tissues that have, um, you know, up to this point just kind of been there, have been developing, working um, pretty much in tandem, become more organized systems. We start to see an independent circulatory system, nervous system, um, you know, gastrointestinal system, that sort of thing. And we also start to see um, the genitals begin to form. Now, it's not like they're fully formed, it's just they start to form. We see more um, external features developed, and then we also start to detect an actual discernible heartbeat. And at this point, the first trimester has ended um, by the end of month three. And there are three trimesters, tri, obviously, and so, um, so it's about a third of the way through now. Well, not quite, but <laughs> the first, the f yeah, there's, eight, there's uh, how many weeks? Nine weeks? Yeah, so a third of the way through. Okay. Or, sorry, nine months. Sorry. <laughs> I'm tired. It, I had a very long weekend. And this is what the fetus looks like. Um, but, you know, it, it looks like a little tiny human at this point. There's still, like, still a lot of, like, parts that could be f better formed. But for the most part, this is what a human being looks like. And so we're starting to see something that resembles what it will look like um, when it comes out of the, of the mom. But it's still a lot more to go. Um, here again, it's the umbilical cord, the amnion, the placenta. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of chilling there. Hear heartbeat, moves around a little bit, just kind of, just kind of riding it out, waiting to finish developing. 
Then we enter the second trimester, and this is week 13 to 28. And during the second trimester, the fetus becomes covered with vernix. And these are cheese, this is a cheese-like substance, so it looks like cottage cheese. And it, it's designed to protect the skin from the amniotic fluid. So, you know, if you keep your body in the bath too long, you you come out and you look pruney and your skin's all weird. Well, if you were, if you were laying in water for uh, nine months, then you're going to have probably worse than that. And so... What the vernix does um, is provide some kind of protection. Um, it's sort of like putting conditioner all over your body to keep it nice and soft. And to hold that on, because it, you're floating around in water, so to hold that on, lanugo forms. And these are tiny hairs that um, that cling that the lanugo can cling to. It's really it's you say tiny, it's actually really like thick and furry. So the baby comes out and it's kind of furry for a couple days. By the end of the second trimester, we start to see all of our organ systems pretty well developed. So we have discernible heart, lungs, stomach, uh, brain, like everything is, is very clearly there, pretty much developed. Our neural development is also nearly completed by the second trimester. And our behave we start to see behavioral responses. So we start to see a little bit of personality form, a little bit of behavior pattern. It's not just reactions, it's actual discernible behavioral patterns. And this is what 22 weeks looks like. This is a 3D ultrasound, pretty cool that we have that. Um, looks like a very emaciated person, but you know, it, it you can see what looks like clearly a baby it's clearly a baby. And then we enter the last trimester, and this is from week 28 to birth. Um, and at this point, we've entered what's called the age of viability. And what that means is babies can survive birth from week 22 onward, but those born before eight months will need intensive care. Um, anything before that, there's not a, the, the physical development required to, to sustain life just is not there. Um, and the baby would die. Um, if it was born before 22 weeks, but after that it's fine. But if it's if it's not at eight month, then it's going to need some very serious help. Um, and then, I'm sure there are people in the class who are premature, and we'll talk more about premature birth in a minute. By the third trimester, the the child is awake 11 to 16 percent of the time. We also start to see sophistication of neural activity. So. Um, responses just aren't, our, our reactions just aren't, or our movement isn't just in response to things. It's, it's intentional. There is some intentionality going on. Um, temperament emerges, so baby will become moody or um, pretty like relaxed. And you know, you'll hear moms talk about, well, it, baby's just dancing around or jumping around, and that's that's the temperament starting to develop. Um, in the third trimester, the, the baby starts to recognize voices and to feel pain. And so we start to see, um, you know, recognition of voices and feeling your pain. There's some pretty sophisticated sensation and perception um, going on. So um, really getting towards, in this point, getting towards um, becoming fully developed as a tiny, tiny human. And then that's what uh, uh, a fetus looks like, pretty close to birth. So you know, very much discernible face and in body parts. Now, in terms of development, there are many different things that could cause harm to a developing um, infant. Um, the first well, the, the main harmful influences are teratogens. And these are environmental agents that can harm the baby. So example would be prescription drugs or illegal drugs, um, tobacco, alcohol, radiation, pollution, and disease. And all of these things individually or together can create some pretty negative outcomes. One of the most harmful examples of a teratogen is the prescription drug th drug thalidomide, which was pre prescribed to pregnant women in the 1950s for um, um, nausea. 
and it w worked wonders to reduce morning sickness. However, um, they started to see in the 50s a bunch of babies born with um, underdeveloped limbs. So, you know, this example, this child um, has tiny arms and, 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 um, and hands and then tiny feet and tiny legs. And it doesn't really, they're not fully formed. And so that there was a huge, like, fear of what, what is this? Is it the harm of radiation? You know, it was right after World War II. Did the Germans bar, um, drop some kind of, like, toxin on us when they were bombing us? Like, what's going on? This, out, this happened, a lot of it, the outbreak was in England. Um, but, I mean, there was also in the United States as well. But um, there's this really great television series on Netflix called The Midwife that takes place in the 50s. And this is a huge storyline, so it's really interesting. So if you're interested in that, you should watch Call the Midwife because you can learn a lot about it. Uh, actually, it was cool. I was watching Call the Midwife last semester as I was teaching this class for the first time. And um, the, the thalidomide storyline started about the same time I was teaching, so it's pretty cool. Um, but it caused a lot of harm. And what they found was... Um, a pretty clear pattern emerged that women who took thalidomide at a certain stage in their pregnancy would one, almost 100% of the time have these um, uh, malformations in their infant when it was born. But it, other women who took it at other points in their pregnancy, they didn't have the same outcomes. And so um, it was interesting because you could pretty much say if you took thalidomide at this at this week you would have this problem if you took it at this week you would have this problem but if you took it this week you'd have no problems at all and so it, it, they they pulled the drug from the market obviously but it was it's really interesting um, that there seemed to be this critical period of development within the uterus um, that where this this drug could cause really horrible outcomes for um, the infant Another um, horrible outcome that can happen from teratogens is having um, um, oh, fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is an example of what happens when you um, drink um, while you're pregnant. Your child can have fetal alcohol syndrome. And, and this, this girl has it. And you can see there's a smaller head. Um, you've got a low nasal bridge smaller eye openings, flat mid face, short nose. Um, the filtrum, that's the little, um, I, don't, I don't really know how to describe it. If you, if you rub your finger across your upper lip, there's sort of a little dip in the middle under your nose, that's the filtrum. But if you don't have one, because your parents drank while you were pregnant, thin upper lip and then underdeveloped jaw. Um, so, you know, these are some harmful f physical developments. And um, I worked in an orphanage for a while and this was in Alabama, it was attached to the women's prison in Montgomery, and um, I got to see firsthand some of the negative effects of taking illicit drugs um, while pregnant. Um, I worked with a lot of what we would flippantly call crack babies, um, uh, babies whose mothers had used crack cocaine while they were um, in utero, and these, these children were incredibly sickly, and um, they had these really, really shrill cries and would throw up all the time and were just always uncomfortable and unhappy. And part of it was because they were addicted to cocaine, and um, it had seriously affected their development. They were going to always have a lot of physical issues as a result. It was very upsetting. And so you have to think about... This is something that women have to think about, especially, but men too, because secondhand smoke and um, can also cause issues. But when you're when you're incubating a new life, you have to give up a lot of things, and you have to take extra care because if not, teratogens can, in fact, ruin someone's development. They can start you off on a really bad foot when it comes to how you're going to develop. And there are other maternal factors that could be harmful influences. So, for example, nutrition, if the mom's not eating well, um, emotional stress, this is where dad can come in, or, or other mom, or other um, external 
relationships that the mother is having, emotional stress can cause a lot of harm. Stress produces um, a, a hormone called cortisol, which reduces life expectancy, and it, it causes heart issues. And so all of that transmits to the baby because the baby is connected to mom through the umbilical cord. So if you're having a hard time, then it's going to translate to the baby. RH factor incompatibility is another. This is actually pretty scary. This is when your your maternal RH factor and the baby's RH factor don't match, and so your body starts to see it as a disease and attacks it. And it's actually pretty pretty scary because your body is literally identifies the baby as a as a leech essentially, which is what it is. I mean, if we're going to be real honest about it, it's it's sucking nutrients off of you, um, but the the body doesn't recognize it as a baby and so it starts to attack it and you could auto abort but fortunately we have we have ways of making this stop um, we have um, there are medical interventions that can occur that can prevent this from being an issue and then of course maternal age is also a big factor if you're an older mom um, you are at increased risk for um, having a child with some developmental issues um, Maternal age has been found to be associated with things like autism, um, other um, psychological issues, um, other health issues for the baby. It can put you at a high risk for um, pregnancy. Um, a lot of a lot of older mothers have to have a lot more medical supervision throughout pregnancy because otherwise um, the the baby may not may not survive the pregnancy or the childbirth, nor could the mother. So it is always riskier. But people are having babies at later ages now, so it's something that we have to be mindful of. So let's talk about the miracle of birth. Now it's presented as this beautiful, beautiful thing. And the reality is the beauty and the miracle of birth is that we survive it and that marriages don't fall apart after it's over. And also, frankly, that we love our offspring because <laughs> birth is incredibly painful, and it's 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 one hell of a time. So we're gonna enjoy this lecture. I think it's it's always a fun one, and it's it's hard for me teaching it without um, an audience because it's it's so fun to do, and you have people laughing at you. So, <laughs> well, but I will do my best. So let's just familiarize ourselves with. Uh, the woman's body, because um, it's a mystery to both men and women. We don't necessarily understand how all the things work together. So let's start with what's going on inside. So we have here the uterus, the uterus, right? And so this is the place where the baby, um, where the blastocysts and the zygote become uh, an embryo, which becomes a fetus, which becomes uh, a human being, and so we've got we've got the the uterus. Inside the uterus, we've got the amniotic fluid, um, which is in, encased by this this white thing right here, which is the amnion. It's a little sac that's keeping um, baby safe and the fluids keeping baby um, sort of in this floating stasis so that it's not um, bouncing around hitting up against the uterus which is remember wedged up wedged between organs and and muscles and bones we've got the placenta here the organ that connects to connects baby to mom through the uterus uh, you can see all the different veins running through it's filtering out toxins providing nutrients regulating the temperature, everything. We've got the umbilical cord right here that's connected to baby's belly button. And then down here, this is the cervix. This is the opening to the uterus. This is what um, has to open for baby to come out. It's sort of like a dam. Um, it is holding all of this in. Um, and during pregnancy, what happens is the uterus begins to contract and this starts to open. And then we've got the canal, the birth canal, um, which exits through the vagina. And so the, the, the male contributes his uh, gamete through the vagina. It comes through the uterus to the ovaries 
um, which are somewhere around in here, and then the baby comes out of it. So the vagina is sort of the gateway to this entire um, birthing process. So now that we understand the structures, let's talk about what happens. Childbirth begins with the amniotic sac breaking. So remember, we'll just go back and look at it. The sac right here breaks down here. And when it does so, the amniotic fluid flows from the uterus through the cervix and out of the vagina. And so this is always the big plot twist, or I don't know if it's twit, but like the, the big mechanism by which birth begins and all the movies. You know, the woman's just standing there and all of a sudden she's like, oh, ah! and then a little bit of water comes out. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, like you spilled half a glass of water or something. False. Okay. Um, when the amniotic sac breaks, you've got fluid and the fluid, the amount of fluid that you have is enough to fill from your vagina up to probably right under your breasts. So that whole area of your body is full of water and baby. Now obviously baby's going to be taking up some of that space, but you have to remember the water is holding baby up. It's got to be enough water to suspend baby. So when that water comes out, we're not talking a little trickle. We're talking Niagara Falls. It's like, whoosh, and it's like it just keeps going and it never stops. And like, heaven help, the car that you're in, the bed that you're in, the carpet that you're on, because when it comes out, it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be Niagara Falls. People are going to be coming to take pictures with a rain jacket on um, and, and saying, oh, it's, it's so beautiful. It's a miracle of birth. Um, and you're just going to be like, I'm completely destroyed and I, I never want to see the light of day again. Um, when the amniotic sac breaks, 80% of the time contractions have already started. So muscle contractions, the uterus, this right here, is contracting. And that's usually what breaks the sac. Now, if your labor is induced, um, part of the process is breaking that sac. Now, labor, for after the sac breaks, labor can begin in a period of a few hours to a few days. So, you know, in the movies, it's like, oh, the water breaks. It's like, trickle, trickle. Mm, my baby's coming. Let's go to the emergency room. And the dad's running around like, oh, where's the suitcase? Where's the, the car seat I forgot to put in, which you've been asking me to put in for months? Oh, my gosh, where are my keys? Where are my pants? Where am I, where's my head? Um, and everyone's rushing around because baby is on the way, and the baby's going to come out in the car if you don't hurry. That's not always true. Sometimes you can have that experience and you can have contractions and it lasts for days and you're sitting you're sitting in the doctor's office at the hospital at home like please God either kill me or get this damn baby out because I am not dealing with this anymore because it hurts because you're literally having muscle spasms as as things happen and we'll talk about what those things are in just a minute and it'll be horrifying. Of course, it could happen in a few hours, so it's always important when your water breaks to call your OBGYN get yourself to the hospital, um, because you don't obviously want to wait. But you also don't have to worry that, like, oh, it's going to happen all of a sudden, because it takes a long time for pregnancy to occur. Or for, sorry, childbirth to occur. Pregnancy, too. So let's talk about the stages of childbirth. Stage one is dilation and effacement of the cervix. So let's go back to our little structure. Here's the cervix. Now it's really tiny. You can see there's a barely anything, um, any space right there, probably the size of a pencil. Well, guess what? That mother has to open all the way so that this baby can come out. And so that's what's happening in stage one. This is the longest stage of birth. It goes from 12 to 16 hours if this is your first ever birth. So if you've never had a child before, be prepared for half a day's uh, amount of pain and frustration. Now, if you have your second or third child, it's about four to six hours, so it's not as long. The contractions start out slow, so it's always like the woman, you know, in the movies, the woman is just like sitting at her desk or sitting in the living room, like lovingly knitting a, a little bonnet for baby, and she's dressed up and has makeup and her hair done. That is not how it's going to happen, by the way. By the end, you're going to be like basically a cave woman, and you're going to love it and not really, you know, care what anyone thinks of you and your moo moo. Um, the contractions 
and then and then all of a sudden you know she's sitting there putting proper and then the contraction starts and it goes from like dun, 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 oh it hurts so bad that's not really <coughs> how it goes it, it increases in frequency and power so it's going to start off and it's you're going to feel unsettled it's going to be like it's going to be painful it's going to be like you I mean, this is a really crude comparison, but honestly, this is, as I've been reliably informed, what it feels like. It's sort of like the early stages of needing to, to, you know, take a poop. Like, you start to feel a little, like, uneasy, and you start to feel movement where there hasn't been any before. And what's happening in both situations is your muscles are contracting to push something out. And during this first stage, as these contractions are increasing in frequency and power, so they're going from, like, really small to really, really powerful. So what you would can think of when you think of a contraction, the, the <laughs> kind of contractions. Um, the cervix is dilating, so it's getting bigger um, from one centimeter to 10 centimeters. Now I know that we're all, probably all of us are Americans and we don't know what a centimeter is. Um, so I'm gonna show you what a centimeter is. Um, in just a second. But as the cervix is dilating, it's widening and it's thinning out. So you have two things happening. You have the opening getting bigger and you have the skin that makes up that opening getting stretched very, very thin. So imagine pulling your bottom lip out and like putting it over your head and that's what would be happening. And this is creating a clear exit for baby. So baby needs a good way to get out. So I promised you I'd show you what centimeters are. So I'm going to use this fruit. One centimeter is about the size of a zucchini, so right here. Then we just kind of increase, size of a strawberry, banana, lime, kiwi. We're halfway now. Oh, living on a prayer. So we're getting six inches uh, eggplant, apple to an orange, and then when we've gotten to the size of a cantaloupe, that's when we've reached 10 centimeters. So ladies, your lady bits are going to get from the size of a zucchini, or I guess that's not a zucchini, a grape. I don't know. I think this is a grape. I don't know what this is. One centimeter, like this tiny, tiny thing right here though. From that, maybe that's about the size of a dime or a, or a nickel to the size of a cantaloupe. That's how big your lady bits are gonna have to open to get baby out. Guys, there is no pain in the world quite like going from one centimeter to 10 centimeters in diameter. And so this is what's happening over this period of time that could last anywhere from four hours to 16 hours. You're going from this size to this size. And that is clearing uh, the opening for baby to come out. Then we move into stage two, and this is when the baby actually is delivered. It actually slides out down this very wide and thin channel that has been opened for it in your vagina. This is a much shorter stage, um, 50 minutes for your first birth, so you know a little bit under the amount of time for this class. So if you think class lasts forever, just imagine what it'll be like pushing a, a human being out of a 10 centimeter um, hole in your body. Um, but if you've had a baby already, 20 minutes. So in the amount of time we've been talking already, you could have had two babies at this point. While all this is going on, so if it what didn't hurt bad enough that your body is like, has this gaping hole the size of a cantaloupe in it, the muscle spasms, the muscle contractions are still happening, and the uterus is convulsing so that the uterus is shaking the baby through. So it's sort of like, you know, if you like are out in the yard and you run into a spider web and you're shaking your clothes, like you're shaking your body and like shaking your clothes out to try to get the spider out, that's what's going on. The, the uterus is shaking to get baby to slide out. It's like, come on, we're done, leave. And, and sometimes it's quick and sometimes it isn't. And the good thing about this is mom is going to feel an instinct to push with the abdominal muscles. So it's not like you're just sitting there and you're like, I don't know what to do. You're going to know what to do. And, and honestly, like it is like taking a poop. You know, you just, when it, when it has to happen, it has to happen. It feels sort of the same way. Just amplify it to 10 centimeters. 
you're taking a small area, you're making it bigger, thinner, so that you can send something bigger out. And, and you really are, you're using the same exact muscles to push the baby out because you're pushing, you're pushing something out at the, in the same general area. Um, but you, when we look at the movies, when you watch the movies, it's always like, we always make that face. And this is where it's hard to not have a camera. But you know, you're, you're, you make that grunty face like, you know what I'm talking about? And the problem with that is it concentrates all of your muscle energy on your upper body, um, your face. You might tense a little bit like in your, like right below your breast line. But what you're really needing to be moving is down um, in your lower belly um, near your bottom. Like you really need to be like sending muscle energy down there. And so uh, my one of my friends tells this great story of when she was giving birth. Um, she was ready. She knew what to do. She'd seen all the movies. And so she was making the, the face, the scrunched up face. And, you know, it's, it's really undignified giving birth. Let, let me tell you what happens. You go into the hospital and they make you put on this gown. And it, I mean, it's like, what's the point? You know, you might as well just be naked. It doesn't really give you any modesty because it's designed to basically open up and the areas that need to be opened up. And, and if it falls off, it falls off. And you're put on this bed. And it's not really a bed, though. It's more of this very uncomfortable vinyl chair thing that you that you have to lay on. It's basically the same thing that you see when you go see your OBGYN, but for the guys who don't know, um, I don't really know how to des describe what it is. It's kind of like those little hospital exam or the doctor's office examination room tables that they have at the student health center. That's basically what it is. But it also has these things called stirrups, which are these little, um, well, they're 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 leg holder things. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe them. They're like little shepherd's crooks, um, where the crook, is, like the little hook, is is um, is open to the ceiling. And what happens is they put your legs, your your ankles, in these stirrups, and that holds your legs wide open so that the doctor can tinker around in your in your vagina and get the baby out. And so. Um, so this is what happens, and sometimes dad and anyone else in the delivery room may be called upon to hold the legs back a little bit. And so my friend was saying, I'm sitting here, and you know, you're just exposed to the world, like, there's no reason to be wearing the gown, because everyone can see everything, and this, this intern was there, and my husband was holding one leg, and the intern was holding the other, and he was, like, giving me these sympathy contractions, and he was making the same, like, contraction face that you see on the movies, and the doctor looks at me, and she says, honey, I need you to push like you're taking a poop, and literally, I pooped my baby out, and it was one of the most awkward experiences of my life. Um, and so that's what's happening. Um, and let's just walk, I'm going to walk you through the entire process here. Are you ready for this? So here we have it. We have um, right here is the vagina and then the cervix and baby is chilling in the uterus. We can see the amniotic sac, uh, the amnion and the fluid's gone. The amnion is kind of shriveling up and going away and we're, we're experiencing contractions here so the baby can come out. And baby has just now started to push against the cervix. And then the baby's head is fully against the cervix and we haven't quite gotten to our 10 centimeters yet. Now, at this stage, I should say, this stage, this is called crowning. And that's when the crown of the head has started to enter the vagina and the vagina starts to surround it and at this point baby's head has been delivered and that's a good thing we want the head to be delivered um, but we still have a long way to go but we are at 10 centimeters at this point and then baby's body comes out and then we of course got the little scudder he's like yeah, put me back get out of there it was comfy and he's and he's just like he's laying there and dad i'm assuming dad or mom or someone is uh, cutting the umbilical cords this is the umbilical cord and, and here's mommy's tummy and there's the you know the business down there and so the umbilical cord is getting cut off of the baby and what we see right here this is the vernix 
so that cheese-like substance that's that's um, protecting baby's skin. This is what babies look like when they come out. They're disgusting. Um, this is the miracle of birth, is that you see this and you're not like, ah I gave birth to a monster! Um, but, you know, baby is very, very unhappy because this is a very traumatic experience for baby. And baby just wants mommy and wants everyone to leave um, baby alone. And then, of course, um, the, the big handover. This is when it, the baby is now uh, an independent unit. It is no longer attached to mom via umbilical cord. Look at all this. Um, burn. It's disgusting, right? Like, that's nasty. Who would want to hold? I mean, it looks like I'm not even interested in holding that. And I like babies. But doctor is handing baby over to mom. And then mom is holding baby. And baby is still like, what the fuck did you do to me? And mom, and mom, look at mom's face. Mom is just like, you can tell that she's just like, I cannot believe I made this beautiful little living thing. And, and this is really what it's all about right here, this moment when it's all out and you've been through this painful, embarrassing, horrible situation and you finally have your little your little spawn and it's it's a mini me and or many of your husband and you're just like I'm I, I can't believe I did this I'm so happy and then of course the end um, after baby has gotten his little bath and been weighed and been assessed he's like look at me I'm a punk I got this I was born I just like this baby he's gonna go far in this world <laughs> so precious <laughs> All these babies are different babies, by the way. Um, I think. I don't remember where I got all these pictures, to be honest. Stage two, um, while one of the shortest parts of birth, is also one that can have a lot of different complications. Um, so some of the complications that occur could be anoxia. And this is when you get an inadequate oxygen supply to the brain. Um, and this happens in many different ways. One, um, the umbilical cord can get wrapped around the baby's neck um, and can constrict access of oxygen or the flow of oxygen to the brain. Um, the other is if something happens and the umbilical cord is crushed in some way, it could cut flow of blood. Because until the baby is born, um, it's not breathing out of its nose. It's receiving oxygen through the mother's blood. Um, the umbilical cord is delivering blood to the baby that that then it uses for oxygen. And so um, if the umbilical cord gets crushed or wrapped around the baby, it could prevent the flow of oxygen. Um, the other is if the baby goes into the breech position. And this is when you have the delivery of feet or buttocks first. And this is a problem. You want the head to come out as soon as possible. Because the minute the head is born, you can start to, you reduce the, the, um, the likelihood that anoxia will occur because you can, you can get the baby oxygen without um, the use of the umbilical cord. So breach can be can be not a great situation because it can complicate um, the delivery process. It can increase the risk of the baby having some serious damage. Um, so some of the different breach positions. A complete breach is when a baby is curled up in a little ball like this. And so head is up here, bottom is coming out first, and the legs are like this. Um, this is a little bit harder to get out. Um, essentially what you have to do is you have to free the feet, and then you have to very, very gently get the baby out. The other, the other problem is when it comes to the neck. When the head comes out first, the neck is, is always going to be relatively stable. The head doesn't weigh as much as the rest of the body, so if the head's hanging out, it's not going to put the baby at risk. But if the baby's head is stuck inside the mom and the body is hanging out, that puts a lot of undue pressure on the neck and it could snap the neck. So that's another issue. So you have to be very, very careful when you have a breach delivery of how you deliver. So this is a complete breach. A frank breach is when you have um, when it's like a cannonball. The baby's head's up here and both legs are up. And it's, this is also pretty complicated. This is more com less complicated to get out because you can always get one like this. You have to like, a lot of shifting has to happen in order to get baby out. And then incomplete breach is when you have one leg up, one leg down. This is probably the, uh, let's say this is probably the easiest to free. This is second easiest because you can get that leg out and you just have to like shift it up to get the other leg out. Um, 
but you have to be very careful with breach. Um, so, oh, whoops. Ah, spoiler alert. <laughs> so there are many different ways that we can intervene when there are complications to um, um, stage two. The first is fetal monitoring. So we have mom and baby both hooked up to a bunch of different machines, and that um, allows us to track baby's heart rate during stage two. So if at any point the heart rate weakens, um, that would indicate that there is potentially a, lo a loss of blood, a loss of connection to mom through the umbilical cord, and that helps us to move very, very rapidly. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait um, for the whole process. We can do a cesarean section. Um, an epidural. So I talk about the the pain and and just to be clear what it feels like for your cervix to dilate. It's sort of like someone is throwing a, a bowling ball at your groin while simultaneously setting it on fire. It hurts really bad. Like it is the most pain anyone could experience um, in their lifetime. Now fortunately we have in the 21st century something called an epidural and this is a strong analgesic so pain reliever used to reduce the pain of, of childbirth. Now it comes in this really big syringe with a really honking big needle but it's totally worth it. It's like I've had epidurals for other things and let me tell you you're just like I give zero fucks about anything. Like oh my gosh the world is amazing i want to be like this all the time and you're literally just chilling and you're just like i love it i don't care um just like take the baby out i'm great i'm absolutely great um so you know it's a personal choice my mom had, had six kids uh no seven kids wow what a woman <laughs> all by the same husband too pretty pretty impressive they're still together um, after having seven kids um, but she didn't have an epidural for any of us so you know you could have a, a non epidural birth you can have one it's a personal choice it's all up to you about what you want um, personally I don't think that the pain would enhance the bond I think it's just going to make your life miserable I don't see why you wouldn't have an epidural but you know it is what it is. Do what you want. <laughs> Cesarean delivery is another intervention that we can do, and this is a surgical birth. So the baby doesn't come out of the vagina. It comes out of a hole in the stomach. Um, and the, you just make an incision in the abdomen, ab <laughs> abdomen, the abdominal region, and the baby is just pulled right out. Um, this happens usually It's pretty standard for for. Um, births where the mom is older, um, high-risk pregnancies too, um, and also in any kind of emergency situation where there's a potential that the baby's going to be harmed, it's easier to just pull it out through surgery very quickly. And then you could also do this in response to a breach if you needed to. So then we get to stage three, and this is the last stage. It's pretty quick, and this is the delivery of the placenta. So the, the woman's body makes this organ that is designed to protect, to sustain baby's life, but she doesn't need it if she doesn't have a baby, and so it has to come out, and it actually does have to come out because after childbirth is over, um, the placenta starts to die, so if it doesn't come out, then you could get really, really sick because you have this decaying, decomposing organ in your body. And so after the baby comes out and you look at the baby and you're like, oh, it's so sweet, oh, I love it, oh, I don't ever want to leave it again. Um, you have a few final contractions and pushes. And during this period, the placenta separates from the uterine wall. And then it just, com just comes out. It takes about five to ten minutes. <clears throat> so my friend's husband tells a slightly different story about when their child was born. Um, usually they tell you... They tell the dad, they said, Dad, come over here and, and watch the baby while it gets its little bath, and we do our quick assessment and everything. And so usually dad obeys, and they, and they advise not to look back. Um, and it's sort of like in the Old Testament of the um, Christian Bible, when Lot's wife looks back at Sodom um, and turns into a pillar of salt. This sort of thing happens to you if you look back after um, childbirth, because if you're, if you're very unlucky, then you get to watch the delivery of the placenta. And to quote my friend's husband, I've seen things. 
Um, Because he looked back and he saw it and it was horrifying. But what happens is this huge glob, it's like a jellyfish, just like spews out of the vagina with remaining fluid, blood, anything that's just chilling in there. I mean, it is a total purge, man. And like women, it is very common for women to also have a bowel movement. Um, at the same time when they're giving birth because of all the contractions you're in there for like a whole day so I mean it can be a pretty disgusting experience to watch now if you're giving birth and you're on an epidural you have no idea any of this is going on if you're not on an epidural you only know that it's happening because I've just told you so now that I've ruined the miracle of birth for you let me tell you what it looks like That is what you will see come out of your lady if you look back. So my advice, I mean, it's disgusting, right? And this thing is attached to the uterus, and this cord is attached to the baby. So the advice is to not look back, and you won't see it. And they'll clean it all up, and you'll never have to look at it. Now, what about baby? We talked a lot about what's going on for mom during birth. What about baby? Well, birth is a very painful experience for mom, but it's not that traumatic for baby. Um, And the reason of this is the force of the contractions cause the baby to produce large amounts of stress hormones. So imagine being inside of a... Imagine you're you're Woody from Toy Story, and you're in a shopping bag, and you're being bounced around. Well, that's what pregnancy is like, and it stresses you, it stresses out the baby, and that sends large amounts of blood and oxygen to the brain. Um, and when it does that, it's like a, a, an adrenaline rush. It's like it, it's terrifying, but it also like gives you the energy and the strength. And it, this also does two other important things. The first is it prepares the baby to breathe. So when, it, when baby comes out, obviously the first goal is to get it to breathe on its own. So you have to clear the airway. Um, you know, you've got that traditional slap the baby a couple times, slap, slap, wee. Well, that's not how we do it anymore. We've got a sucker thing. So it's like you stick it in there, and it sucks out all the like slime that's in there and gets the baby ready to breathe. And then it also wakes the infant up in preparation for experiencing the outside world. So it's important for baby to be awake when baby is born so that 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 it can breathe and it can live and it can enjoy its mommy for the first time on the outside. In terms of afterbirth, um, babies average about 20 inches long, so a little under two feet, and then they weigh it on average about seven and a half pounds. Now, the first couple of things that happen when a baby is born, obviously, you know, it's the umbilical cords removed and it's given to mom and mom is like, oh, he's so beautiful, I love this baby, I'm never going to leave it. And then the nurse is like, okay, i got to take the baby now. And they take the baby over and they weigh it, they measure it, um, they clean it, they give it a little bath, a little sponge bath. Oh, <laughs> he's so precious with a little sponge bath. There's a cute video of, of, of birth that I usually show, but I'm not going to show it today. Um, but it's cute. The baby getting this little sponge bath, and he's like, Mee! doesn't like, does not like getting, but getting born. That's what babies sound like too. They're they're really really obnoxious, and if you didn't give birth to it, then you really would hate it. Um, but we also do a quick assessment, and it's called the APGAR scale, and it's a quick measure of the baby's physical condition. And the APGAR assessment is done one minute and five minutes perinatal, so after birth. So at one minute, we do the assessment, and then five minutes after the birth, we do it again. Um, and there are, th- are three different types of scores you can have. A score of seven plus means the baby is going to be fine. We're not worried at all. A score of four to six means the baby needs help in establishing breathing and vital signs. So there's some issues, but it's not critical yet. But if the score is a three or less, then baby is in critical danger. The APGAR scale was developed by a nurse. Her name is Virginia APGAR. Um, and she used her last name and she created an acronym to go with it. So A stands for activity, um, P for pulse, G for grimace, A for appearance, and R for respiration. And so you get a certain number of points based on whether or not you see different things. If for activity, if activity is absent, you get zero points. If you have your arms and legs are like, or are moving in some way, then one point. But if you're really active, like you're thrashing around, then you get two points. Pulse, obviously zero if it's absent. If it's below 100 beats per minute, one point. Over 100 beats per minute, two points. 
grimace. So um, this is just like when you look at the baby's face, is it making like like is it mean mugging you? Um, essentially, if it's kind of f and also just like just general reflexes as well. So like if you hold the baby, like you put your finger in the baby's palm, does it like grab it? Um, floppy, so kind of not really very consistent. Zero points. One minimal response, so like you're you're kind of getting a little bit, but it's not very strong. Um, that would be a one point prompt response. So you you put your finger in the baby's palm and it grabs it immediately. That would be two points. Appearance of the color of the skin, um, blue or pale, zero points. Pink body but blue extremities. That means that your circulation isn't going too well. Pink means that you've got full circulation. Respiration, no breathing, obviously, um, zero points, one point for slow or regular, and then if the baby is crying a lot, then two points, because that if you're crying, it means you're getting oxygen. Let's talk premature babies. So I am a preemie. I was born at eight weeks. Um, my original due date was actually on the 14th of June, but I was born early. Um, on May the 11th, so it's a little, little shy of a month over um, or under. Um, and these are babies that are born three to and a half plus weeks before 38 weeks, or have a birth weight of five and point five or less. So it, you could be on time, but if your weight is 5.5, then you're still considered premature because you're not where you should be in terms of development. And there are two different types of premature uh, babies. First is preterm. So these are babies that are born several weeks or more before their due date. So I was preterm premature baby. Small for birth are babies who are low weight but are at full term. So this is a child who does make it to the, you know, the full nine weeks, but they're just a little bit, a little light for their age. Birth weight is a strong predictor of healthy outcomes for premature babies, both perinatal and through adolescence and adulthood. Um, and some of the outcomes from being premature is frequent illness, you could have cognitive development delays, or you could have emotional and psychological difficulties. So there are a lot of different things that could happen if you're premature. But the good thing is, in the 21st century, we're very fortunate to have a very good medical system um, in the U.S. that allows for premature babies to survive. Um, you know, it is dodgy, it is, it can be a very stressful time, but I was in the hospital for two weeks when I was born, and, and I'm happy to report that I don't really have any ill side effects of being premature. Um, I am kind of cranky, but I don't know if that has anything to do with that, or if it's just because I don't work too much and don't take a lot of breaks. But um, as, a, as extra credit, for two points, if you're premature, were born premature, share about it. Tell us how how um, much premature you were and how long you were in the hospital. If you know it, if you don't, you can just say, "Hey, I was premature, and I'm okay." Um, <laughs> I'll give you two points um, towards your participation. So just tack that on to uh, your discussion for today. Same with the pregnancy thing. Tack that on to your discussion for today. Let's move into the last section of our class today. We'll be talking about the newborn. So the newborns are very fascinating creatures. Um, they're tiny humans, and they spend all this time developing tiny human behaviors, and it's really cute. Um, and in the newborn period, babies kind of go in and out of five different stages. Um, and these stages are called states of arousal, and they're basically degrees of sleep and wakefulness because babies don't really know how to do very much, or newborns don't know how to do very much. So we have regular sleep, which is about eight to nine hours, and this is when you're going into a full REM cycle, you're sleeping soundly, you're, there's not a lot of movement. And then about eight or nine hours of the day, it's also made up of irregular sleep. So this is when you're kind of drowsing or you're coming in and out of sleep, but you haven't quite reached um, REMs, the REM cycle yet. Drowsiness, this kind of varies, you know, and that's when the baby is just kind of sitting there blinking its eyes and like, you know, just kind of being cute and like, like looking like, like they're drunk because they can't keep their eyes open and they can't really stay steady. You know, they're, they're drowsing, they're going off. Um, quiet alertness, about two to three hours a day. Um, that's when babies just kind of sit in there staring around, chewing on stuff, 
not making any noise, it's not really moving around too much. And then waking activity and crying is about one to four hours of, of the day. And that's, you know, crying, moving around, waking up, um, getting more active. This is just getting them out of the sleep, out of the sleep cycle. After birth and in the first month or so of life, um, babies begin to develop more sophisticated sensory capacities. In terms of touch, babies or newborns are very sensitive to sensations around their mouth, their hands, and their feet, and they're very sensitive to pain. And these have some pretty important evolutionary um, and adaptive um, qualities to them. I mean, you want to be sensitive in areas that will get you fed, so your mouth and your hands, and then also your feet. Um, even though they can't walk, it's important that you have sensation in your feet because they have to be prepared um, for a time when they're going to be using their feet more. Also, sensitivity to pain is important because obviously if you're in pain, you need to be able to make it stop. You need to habituate to making it stop. Um, taste and smell are another area that babies have sensory capacity for. Facial expressions change with different tastes and smells. You see babies smile a little bit or grimace or make ugly faces. Um, and this is important because it allows uh, mom to know how baby's reacting to things. It also is an indication that baby has some different temperaments and personalities developing. Um, and then also babies can recognize the smell of their mom and they prefer it. Again, that's really adaptive. You want to make sure that you stick with mom. You may not be able to see her really well. You may not be able to recognize her all the time, but you can smell it. If you can smell mom, then then you are going to be safe. You know that you're in the right with the right person. Um, with hearing, um, babies or newborns are very sensitive to complex sounds so that they can hear like different patterns of sounds, differing levels of sounds, and this improves rapidly over the first few months. And over time, and newborns begin to distinguish between different types of sounds, and they can also distinguish and recognize voices and recognize their own la native language. And this is really fascinating, and some of the studies that have been done to, to teach us that or to, to help us understand how babies rec can recognize voices were done um, by developmental psychologists. And one of the studies was the Dr. Seuss study, which I think is really cool. What a name for a study. Um, but they, they had <coughs> parents read a Dr. Seuss book to um, their baby while it was in utero, so while it was being developed in the uterus. Um, and then they had the mom read the book to the baby um, after it was born, and the baby favored the story. And so, um, and so they were like, well, that's interesting. But then they, they had this idea, they had this question. They, re they realized there was a third variable. They were like, does this mean that the, the baby recognizes the mom's voice, or does it, is it just that the mom, that the baby prefers that story, that the baby recognizes the story? And so they did a second study, and what they did was they had the same thing happen. Mom read the Dr. Seuss book, and then they put the baby in a lab, and then they exposed the baby to a sound recording of a stranger reading that story or the mom reading a different story. And the baby would pay attention or, or favored the story um, that was read by the mom, even though it was a different story. And so they were able to determine through an experiment that the baby in did indeed recognize its mom's voice and prefer it. In terms of vision though, babies have very limited vision. It's the least developed sense and it makes sense, right? Because when you're when you're chilling in amniotic fluid, there's nothing really to look at. So you're not really looking at anything. Um, but it develops, it still is developing and it, it develops pretty efficiently during the newborn stage. Um, infants actively explore their world and take everything in that they can see. And you, if you watch a baby, if you see a baby out in public, you'll see this happening. Their eyes are super big and they stare at everything and that they're taking things in. They're learning, they're remembering it, they're analyzing it. Babies are active thinkers. They're actually pretty fascinating creatures. For your discussion board for today, what I would like for you to do is I want you to go to this YouTube video and I want you to identify um, the different states of arousals, um, 
the different reflexes and the different responses to stimuli. And you can't do this because we're missing some things in this lecture, like we didn't talk about reflexes or anything. That's frustrating. So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and post this video and I'm going to go back and look at my slides and figure out what happened because I did not do a run through before the class started. So what I want you to do is watch this and I want you um, to watch it after I post the second little section of this class um, and then I want you to identify the states of arousal that you see, um, the reflexes and responses, and then provide a brief report on what you identify. So I'm going to leave this up. I'm going to quickly look and see if I can figure out what's going on and then if I can I can just add them in really fast and we can just keep going. Okay, thanks for sticking with it. I, it's just one slide that was missing. I just deleted it by accident. So I'm actually, it's, I'm going to have it up here and just give me a quick second because I want to copy something else over. Um, there's a video that I normally show. I'm not going to show it to you um, because you can just look it up on YouTube. So just um, stick with me. I'm sorry. This is really frustrating. And I, I do apologize that this happened. Um. I usually look through this beforehand, but I didn't today because I was being irresponsible. Okay. Thank you for bearing with. Let's talk about reflexes. <clears throat> reflexes are inborn automatic responses to particular stimuli. And so we can all 
we can all think about this. If you are, if you were to like hit your knee, you'd probably react to it. Ow. Oh, I just hit my knee and it hurt. <laughs> That's a reaction, right? It's something we do automatically. You don't really think about a response. You don't think, well, you know, if somebody hits my knee, I'm going to go, ow. Like, it's just something that happens. And infants and newborns have really, have a lot more reflexes than we actually have as adults. Um, versus the eye blink. So infants blink their eyes a lot. And the reason they do this is they're adjusting to light. Um, it's really just an adaptive um, reflex to, to help, you know, prevent their eyes from getting harmed because they're not used to, to seeing things. They're not used to um, the light. So the blinking helps them adjust their eyes to the light. Um, rooting, this happens up to three weeks. And that's when, if you put anything near the baby's mouth, um, the baby will start sucking on it. And this just as a way to help them get nourishment. Typically the, you know, anything that goes near the baby's mouth, like, you know, the mom's nipple, for example, would be something that they would, wanna, would want to, to latch on to. So the rooting reflex is just when you feel something close to your mouth, putting, your, putting it in your mouth. Sucking is sucking on anything that's in your mouth, and that's, that happens automatically up to four months. And so you'll see babies putting things in their mouth and sucking all the time, and that's just a sort of a reflex that they have to um, the, you know, having something in their mouth. The moral reflex is really interesting. Um, and this is something that only happens up till six months, and then we don't ever see it again. Um, but this is when, um, this is a re rea reaction to a sudden loss of support. So like if you, if you drop the baby backwards, they flail their arms out automatically. Um, they spread the arms out, which is abduction, or they in spread them in, which is adduction, and then they will cry. Um, and this is, uh, this is just a way for them to restabilize. So if you drop the baby back, they're gonna they're gonna reach their arms out and they may clutch in trying to grab at something to support themselves and then they'll cry to let mom or caregiver know that they're that they're unstabilized. The Palmer grass. This is another interesting one. This is when they grab onto things with their hands. So like, you think, oh, the baby's holding my hand when they when they hold my finger. No, they're just grasping onto you, <laughs> because it's a reflex. It's the Palmer grasp, and and the reason babies do the Palmer grasp again is just to to cling on to things for support. It also is a good way to practice using their hands too. Um, tonic neck is also an interesting reflex. And this, this is also interesting. Um, this is, sorry, I've got an email that's, that's distracting me, sorry. <laughs> um, but the tonic neck is the way that the baby puts its head. So, it, so it's also known as the fencing posture. And it, it the head turns to the side, um, and the arm um, on that side will straighten, and the opposite arm will bend sometime um, very subtly or slightly, and this is um, and this is just to kind of keep the baby, um, you know, keep the baby um, ha airways clear. And we're not entirely sure why this happens, but it's just it's just an interesting reflex. If the baby's head is on its side, then it puts its arm out, one arm out on that side. Um, straighten and the opposite arm just kind of bend. So it looks sort of like you're fencing. Um, so if you fence, you'll understand this. You've got one arm straight out in front of you and the other sort of at the side. Um, I wish I had a camera I could show you. It's hard to try. I'm trying to figure out how to explain it. Um, so just if you're laying on, if you ever lay on your bed, just lay on your side, put your, lay on your left side, put your left arm out in front of you, put your right arm, like lean it against your side, um, um, sort of bent, um, at a 45 degree angle, and that's what it looks like. Uh, stepping, this is when, you know, if you're holding the baby by, like, under its armpits and you put its legs on the ground, it'll kind of make stepping motions, and this happens up to two months, and it's just sort of a precursor to walking. Um, pretty cool, though. People think, oh, the baby's walking. It's like, mm, not really. Um, but,
but yes. Uh, and then the Babinski response, which um, when you push down um, on the baby's hands, they they ref they uh, flex it. Um, I'm sorry, this is the foot, sorry. Babinski is the foot. So like, if you rub your fingers up against the baby's foot, the baby's curl f like or feet splay outward and then crawl inwards. Uh, again, it's just sort of a precursor to walking and then having um, foot motion. Sorry I'm so distracted. Uh, it's, I have an appointment in five minutes and I'm like trying to send an email saying, hey, can you come? I'm a little behind teaching today. Um, <clears throat> so that, those are the reflexes. And if you want to kind of see examples of them, you can go to this YouTube video, and it has a good, it's, it's what I normally show in class, but I don't know if YouTube really likes you to show other videos inside your videos, so that's why I'm not showing you the video. I'm just giving you the link to go watch if you're interested. Okay, so now your <laughs> discussion question will make sense. Um, watch this video. Identify states of arousal, reflexes, and responses to stimuli, and then provide a brief report on what you identify. You'll want to do this on the week two discussion board, create a class two um, subject, or do, sorry, class five subject, and then do this question, and then any of the bonuses that apply to you. All right? And just for fairness, if you can only get an additional two bonus points today. So if you're both premature and a pata baby, you can only do one of them, but share both if you'd like. Um, it would be interesting to hear your experiences. All right, thank you so much, and if you need me, just let me know. Um, Darcy.CorbettHall at ndsu.edu. Um, I'm in my office today until 1230, so come and see me. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.